Hi, I'm Jesse Alexander, and welcome to The Great War. In the fall of 1920, the French were ready to reorganize the Middle Eastern lands where they held a League of Nations mandate. These included the territory of what is today Lebanon, Syria, and a part of southern Turkey. The French decided to divide these lands into five separate states, which they would oversee, officially to help them achieve independence, but unofficially as colonial possessions. But of course, there were competing interests, and the French and their Lebanese supporters would have to meet the challenge of British interests and Arab arms to achieve their goals. In today's episode, we're going to focus on events surrounding the creation of Greater Lebanon in September 1920, exactly 100 years ago. Now, the territory that would eventually become Greater Lebanon in 1920 had belonged to the Ottoman Empire for centuries, and by 1914 was divided into several administrative regions, the largest of which was Mount Lebanon. Mount Lebanon had formally come into being in 1861, thanks to pressure from the European Great Powers on the Ottomans to create an autonomous province for the Christian majority there. French influence in Lebanon was quite strong in the following years, both in terms of religion and the economy, particularly the French-led introduction of silkworm farming and the construction of the port of Beirut and the Beirut-Damascus railway. The Ottoman Lebanese provinces were inhabited by a mix of different groups who did not always get along. The population of Mount Lebanon was mostly Arabic-speaking Christians belonging to the Maronite Church. Given the Maronites' historic and religious connections to France, with the fall of the Ottoman Empire in 1918, they felt that the time was at hand to lobby for independence. But an independence with very close guidance from France. The other major group within Mount Lebanon were the Druze, who practiced a religion based on Islam, but who were not considered Orthodox Muslims. Some of them actively resisted the Ottomans during the war, and now that the war was over, the Druze community leaders hoped for a British mandate. To the north, east, and south of Mount Lebanon, there were also large communities of Orthodox Christians and Muslims, both Sunni and Shia. Some in these communities supported Pan-Arabism, the idea that all Arabs ought to be united into one large and independent state, a goal that was clearly at odds with Maronite aspirations. Nearly all the Muslims and some of the Orthodox Christians living in the areas next to Mount Lebanon wanted British rule instead of French. So the Lebanese provinces were home to several different communities with different political goals in that crucial post-war period, which would determine the fate of the region. And the coming political struggle came on the heels of a wartime humanitarian catastrophe that had caused all of them to suffer. The Great War was a tragedy for the people in Mount Lebanon and the surrounding areas. The region was cut off from French support and suffered political repression at the hands of the local Ottoman commander-in-chief, Jamal Pasha, who had dozens of suspected opponents killed and thousands exiled, especially Arab nationalists. Jamal also imposed conscription, still remembered today by its Ottoman name, Sefer Barlik, or mobilization. There was also a serious shortage of coal, which meant that the forests were cut down for fuel, which then in turn led to a growing problem of deforestation. This problem continued after Allied troops arrived, as the British began shipping lumber to Egypt. Silk production, which was one of the main economic activities before the war, stopped completely, and under the strains of war, the Ottoman administration struggled to govern effectively. But the worst disaster to hit what would become Greater Lebanon during the war was starvation. There was widespread hunger in the entire Ottoman Empire, which was made worse by the Allied naval blockade, but the Ottomans themselves also cut off supplies to Lebanon. This led to a terrible famine, which killed about one-third of the population and was still raging when Allied forces arrived in 1918. French naval medic Dr. Pierre was struck by the suffering of the local people. 
When our first detachments arrived, the scene in the streets of Beirut was horrible. One could believe that he'd landed in a medieval town at the time of the great famines of history. Passers-by were covered in rags, emaciated, with earthy complexions, their eyes shining with fever in the depths of their orbits, dragging themselves miserably, stretching out their hands. Corpses lie everywhere. Carts loaded up with corpses picked up from all corners, dumping up to a hundred a day into the mass grave. To feed the population, the French, British, local churches, Muslim councils, and the new Arab-led provisional government in Damascus all worked to bring in and distribute supplies. French missionaries who had been active in Lebanon before the war and who had then been conscripted into the French army also assisted in the program. By the end of the year, the Allied blockade was lifted and the famine had been brought under control. The French also soon began the first efforts to begin reforestation and to restore agriculture. Throughout 1919, the conditions in the future Lebanon remained difficult. There were hundreds of thousands of Armenian refugees spread throughout the Middle East after the wartime genocide, and French and British authorities now made efforts to relocate them. And one of the main camps was in Beirut, from which refugees could travel to new homes abroad or return to Anatolia. There was also some movement into Lebanon, as prominent locals who'd been exiled to Anatolia by the Ottomans now returned home. The high civilian mortality during the war also left about 20,000 orphans in Lebanese lands, half of whom were Armenian. A major relief effort was organized to place them into orphanages so that they could be cared for. So the Lebanese provinces had been decimated by war and famine when the Allied forces arrived. But humanitarian efforts were not the only concern for the French and British since both had important political aspirations for the region as well. Now, Allied war aims in the Middle East had generally been worked out back in 1916, when the Russians, British and French sealed the Sykes-Picot Agreement. At this stage, the Russians were out of the picture, but British interests in Palestine and Iraq and French hopes for Syria and the Levant remained intact despite the fact that the war had robbed France of the soft power influence that it had built up in Lebanon before 1914. British troops had done most of the fighting against the Ottomans, and so it was they who had first occupied most of the areas as the Ottomans withdrew. French troops also arrived in late 1918, even though at first they remained under British command. Several different zones of occupation were established. The French predominated in the Lebanese provinces and on the Syrian coast, the Hashemite Arab forces in Damascus and Aleppo provinces, and the British further east. French diplomat François-Georges Picot was put in charge of overseeing the French return, a role that was later taken over by General Henri Gouraud in 1919. Now, in theory, the zones were meant to be a temporary measure, as French instructions to their local commanders made clear. The chief administrators and the military governors must be fully aware of the idea that the military occupation is temporary and provisional and cannot in any way prejudge the final settlement which will be established at the peace conference. But tensions soon surfaced with the British and General Edmund Allenby even suggested that French control should be limited to the coast. France wasted no time in making its intention to claim its part of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, regardless of the rivalry with the British or desires for independence among some local actors. In December 1918, French Foreign Minister Stéphane Pichon declared the French position. We have incontestable rights to safeguard in the Empire of the Turks. We have rights in Syria, in Lebanon, in Cilicia, in Palestine. They're based on historical titles, agreements, and contracts. They are also based on the aspirations and wishes of the populations, who have long been our clients. We will do our utmost to assert them, but we consider that these agreements, established with England, continue to bind England and us, 
and that the rights which have been recognized to us and of which we will request the extension to the conference are now acquired rights. Pichon's speech made French intentions clear, but it also set off riots in Damascus, since there was another force in the region, the Arab nationalist movement. Now, when the British had pushed out the Ottomans in 1917 and 1918, they were helped by an Arab force under the command of the Hashemite family. Faisal had led Arab troops in the field as they entered Syria, and now he hoped to establish himself as the king of an Arab kingdom stretching from the Mediterranean all the way to Mesopotamia. Though when push came to shove, he was also willing to compromise. The Syrian National Congress in Damascus, however, took a firmer line, and their vision of Greater Syria included the Lebanese provinces in a future Arab kingdom. Faisal even appointed General Shukri al Ayyubi as governor of Beirut, even though the French had already appointed a governor of their own. Faisal also visited the Lebanese district of Beka to rally the locals, and soon after, issued this memorandum in January 1919. The aim of the Arab nationalist movements is to unite the Arabs eventually into one nation. These conflicting claims did not bode well for relations with a French government that was determined to have a strong presence in the region. So the Lebanese provinces were part of the great political changes coming to the former Ottoman Arab provinces that were now under Allied occupation in 1919 and 1920. And though the war was over, the violence continued. The future Lebanon was surrounded by violent outbreaks on nearly all sides, as a result of the power vacuum left by the collapse of Ottoman power. Arab, Turkish, and Kurdish revolts against the French presence broke out in the Ansariye mountains and around Aleppo, and spread southwards to nearby Antioch and Jabal Kusayir in early 1919. These were put down by the French, but in July, it was the turn of the Alawites to rebel in Hawabi. The French sent troops, but this led to a diplomatic incident with the British, who still had troops in the region and who nearly fired on a French officer traveling with a French-friendly tribal leader. In nearby Cilicia, Armenian-Turkish clashes led to French and Armenian troops becoming embroiled in a full-on war with Turkish nationalist forces under Mustafa Kemal. Fighting here continued until costly battles at Marash, Urfa and Antab forced an armistice between the French and the Turks in May 1920. In the south, there were also clashes between Jews and Arabs in British-occupied Palestine as well. So with so much fighting and chaos in the area, it's no surprise that there was also disorder in 1919 and 1920 within the future Lebanon as well. Various groups of bandits raided the districts of Tyre and Marjayoun. In these same towns, local Christians, Druze, and Shia Muslims also clashed with each other. This resulted in French attacks against the Shiite stronghold of Bintish Bel, and hundreds of Christian refugees fleeing to British-occupied Palestine. Bedouin tribes were also active and raided several districts, including Baalbek. The Bedouins also raided French and Anzac outposts, which caused the British to attack the tribes with aircraft and send a formal protest to Faisal, even though Faisal himself was trying unsuccessfully to stop the Bedouin attacks. Not to be left out, Australian troops also rioted and killed 40 civilians as revenge for the murder of an Australian soldier. So it was against this background of Anglo-French tensions, Arab nationalist ambitions, and ongoing violence that the future of the Lebanese provinces was to be decided. The stage was set for a complicated series of negotiations and eventually a war to decide the fate of Lebanon and the rest of the Middle East, starting with the 1919 peace conference in Paris. Almost as soon as Allied forces had replaced the Ottomans, the jockeying for political advantages had begun. 
on December 17, 1918, the Administrative Council of Mount Lebanon was already beginning to form its demands regarding a Lebanese state. They felt that the Ottomans had broken the 1861 agreement for an autonomous Lebanon and resolved to send a mission to Paris. A delegation will represent the autonomous government of Mount Lebanon at the peace conference to transmit the following claims. Extension of the territory of present-day Lebanon to its historical and geographical limits and the support of the French government for the fulfillment of the aforementioned wishes. The Mount Lebanon delegation, which was led by Dawood Amon, would press their case of territorial additions and independence from their neighbors under French protection. The areas they wished to add to Mount Lebanon included the cities of Beirut, Tripoli, Sidon, and the districts of Akkar, Baalbek, Hasbaya, Rashaya, and Marjayoun. The French, unsurprisingly, supported these claims as the, quote, natural and historic borders of the country to be. But the Syrian nationalists also had their own delegation in Paris and were lobbying hard for an independent Greater Syria, though they disagreed about who would rule it. Syrian National Committee Chair Shukri Khanem argued that historic Syria ought to include both the Lebanese provinces and Palestine, and rejected the Sykes-Picot Agreement. This proposal, however, was not supported by the British or the French, who were still hashing out the implementation of Sykes-Picot amongst themselves. Faisal was in Paris as well, and tried to convince the Allies to accept a unified Arab state from the Mediterranean to Mesopotamia under his rule. But he eventually abandoned this position and argued instead for a greater Syrian kingdom. Lloyd George did show some sympathy for this idea at first, but the French were opposed, since they were determined to gain control over Syria as foreseen in Sykes-Picot. In response to the Syrian claims, another Lebanese delegation, this time under Maronite Patriarch Elias Hoaek, went to Paris in August 1919 to press the Lebanese claims. To make his case, he used a military survey map made by the French army in the 1860s, which became the focus of French ideas of what a future Lebanon would look like, an example of the power of maps in history. At around the same time, the Supreme Council was discussing the Middle East in general, and the British and French finally came to an agreement about what to do with Syria. British forces would withdraw to the east of the Sykes-Picot line, dividing Mesopotamia and Syria. Their place would be taken by the French in the west and Faisal's troops in the occupation zone in Syria. The French also accepted that they would have to come to a border agreement with Faisal. In October and November 1919, the French heard the claims of the Lebanese and those of Faisal as well. After these discussions, Clemenceau and Faisal reached an agreement that Lebanon would be separate from Syria and the disputed Beka region would become a neutral zone, and Faisal would be permitted to become king of Syria, in return for accepting French influence over his new kingdom. Faisal would get his coveted kingdom, and as far as French bureaucrat Étienne Flandin was concerned, France would, quote, safeguard our moral and political preponderance in the eastern basin of the Mediterranean. 1920 would bring a resolution to the Lebanese question, but only after more political wrangling and another war. In January, Alexandre Milran replaced Clemenceau as Prime Minister of France. Milran was a colonialist and put more emphasis on French ambitions in the Middle East. And since the Americans had left the peace conference at the end of 1919, the way was now open for Britain and France to impose their will. In February 1920, Britain and France decided on the future frontiers of much of the Ottoman Empire, including a preliminary agreement on Lebanon's borders. Patriarch Hawaiik sent a third delegation to Paris to ensure that the Lebanese claims for expanded borders known as Greater Lebanon, would be implemented by the French. 
This last Lebanese delegation included not only Christians, but Druze and Shiite representatives as well. This occurred just as the French and British were coming to a final agreement about the future Lebanon's southern frontiers, which had been a bone of contention. The result was that a small strip of territory around Lake Shula, claimed by France and the Lebanese delegations, ended up in British Palestine and the border established along the so-called Deauville Line, in accordance with the claims of the Zionist movement. By mid-1920, the British and French had managed to come to a broad agreement on where the borders of their respective League of Nations mandates in the Middle East would lie. This certainly did not correspond to the aspirations of either Faisal or the Syrian National Congress, which declared him King of Syria in March 1920. This surprised and angered the French, since it went against their agreement with Faisal and the proposed borders of Syria were to include the Lebanese provinces. The French were not amused, and despite Faisal's offer of a generous compromise, French troops invaded Syria from their Lebanese bases in July 1920. Faisal's overmatched Arab army was defeated at the Battle of Maisalun, and he fled the country. This meant that the last barrier to France implementing its plans in Syria and Lebanon had now been removed. There was some discussion about how to divide up the mandated territory. General Gouraud favoured a federation of four Syrian states, which would be joined in a loose confederation with Lebanon. Milran, on the other hand, argued for a separate Lebanon and for dividing Syria into eight smaller statelets. Both agreed that the Ottoman province of Mount Lebanon should be expanded according to the claims of the Lebanese delegations and that old French military map of 1862. Eventually, they reached a compromise. Syria was divided into four states, Jabal al-Druz, Damascus, Aleppo, and the Alawite state, a solution that was unpopular with most of the locals. Mount Lebanon was joined with the surrounding areas, including Tripoli, Baalbek, Beka, Sidon, and Tyre. On September 1st, 1920, the State of Greater Lebanon, or État du Grand Liban, was announced, the forerunner of today's Lebanese Republic. But it was not fully independent, since France would continue to oversee the country under the League of Nations mandate. The creation of Greater Lebanon was controversial from the start, as the French newspaper Le Temps admitted at the time. No doubt the creation of Greater Lebanon will not be unfavorable to the Muslims, whose political influence will grow. A Lebanese policy is nevertheless a policy of protecting Christians in the Orient. In Greater Syria, which we now guide, one must not forget that Muslims outnumber Christians by three to one, and it would be disastrous if we continue to excite the Muslims against us in the future. For many Christian Lebanese, it was a long-awaited nation-building project that had finally come true. For Arab nationalists, it was one more political step away from a united pan-Arab state. For Christian, Druze, and Muslim Lebanese, building a new state that was surrounded by an unstable French Syria and British Palestine would prove to be a difficult task. Nonetheless, the proclamation of the state of Greater Lebanon in September 1920 is considered a major step on the road to Lebanese statehood and eventual independence in the 1940s and efforts to restore the economy, replenish the forests, and grant equal rights to all groups began immediately. But the future of this new state was uncertain, as one historian would later note. The new Grand Liban now encompassed areas that gave Maronite Lebanon a large Muslim population, providing the basis for the intercommunal conflicts that would repeatedly ravage the country in the future. So now that we've followed the story of Greater Lebanon in 1920, let's fast forward to 2020 on YouTube. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what it's like to be a history creator on YouTube, which I have to admit is sometimes not that easy. History creators like us are facing more and more problems talking about certain 
not-so-easy aspects of history uh, here on the YouTube platform. For example, we at Real Time History made an 18-part, five-hour-long mega-documentary about the Battle of Berlin, which would not even be allowed on YouTube because it shows a part of history, as you can imagine, given that it's World War II, that is not really advertiser-friendly. But we are not the type to just sit around and complain, so we went ahead and did something about it. We got together with some other creator friends of ours, and we teamed up to build a platform where creators don't have to worry about demonetization or YouTube's infamous, not particularly transparent algorithm. And this platform is called Nebula. And on Nebula, subscribers like you are directly supporting the creators that you guys like to watch. The content on Nebula is ad-free. For example, the version of this video that's on Nebula does not feature this ad that you are watching right now. So what does all this have to do with CuriosityStream? Which you may remember from the beginning of this video is the sponsor of today's episode and a whole bunch of others as well. Well, the people over at CuriosityStream like documentaries and educational content. So they partnered with Nebula and they're offering you a package deal. If you go to curiositystream.com slash the great war, you can sign up for CuriosityStream and not only get access to their library of documentaries, but you'll also get access to Nebula for free. This is not a trial. You'll have it as long as you're a member of CuriosityStream. And for a limited time, CuriosityStream is offering 26% off their annual plan. And that's less than 15 US dollars a year for both CuriosityStream and its library of classic documentaries and Nebula and its creators. I think it's a fantastic deal. And since virtual learning is quite important in the rather unusual times that we're living in right now, you can watch and learn about World War I and World War II with the Apocalypse documentary series, which I watched and I particularly enjoyed, especially because of the color footage that they offer. Or you can go more in-depth and learn about the Battle of Berlin with our own documentary series called 16 Days in Berlin. And when you sign up and watch, you'll be directly supporting our channel. So that's curiositystream.com slash the great war for 26% off. We want to thank Rabbi Rached for his help with this episode. And we also want to take this opportunity to say that we wish the people of Lebanon well in the midst of the current crisis over there. If you want to support our channel, you can support us on Patreon. We could not do this show without Patreon supporters like Carlos Castaneda. If you become a patron, you can also ask questions to the experts that we interview on our audio podcast, which is also linked below along with the regular Patreon site. I'm Jesse Alexander, and this is The Great War 1920, a production of real-time history and the only YouTube history channel that wants you to know that there were only 10 cars in all of Greater Lebanon in 1920.